Glory to God. Y'all can be seated. Thank you, Lord. There's message one. Message two. All right. Here we go. You ready? <laughs> message number two. Well, it goes in line with what we've been talking about. So if I got on your toes, they're fixing to get healed up. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. No problem. Again, the Lord never corrects out of condemnation. He always corrects in love. And, and, and you know, we find that out. You, you find out, Father, you, you put yourself under that correction. You put yourself under the Lord and you say, Lord, I know you love me. I know there's nothing that's going to separate me or take me out of your hand. And nothing's going to ever, you know, dissolve my relationship with you or even hinder it. So, Lord, I just put myself under your corrective hand. Lord, whatever it is in my life that needs to be corrected, I'll receive that. Glory to God. See, that's the best attitude and the best heart to have. Glory to God. Because, you know, those things that really, and, and really what we're talking about right here, when we're talking about mind renewal, renewing your minds and renovating your uh, hearts, your heart belief system, the Lord wants to get down to the very roots of things. He don't want to just deal on surface issues because you're going to find out that root problems, roots of your thinking, mindsets, and belief systems on inside of your heart, they have to be dealt with for you to progress and for God to do some things in you and through you that he's wanted to do. See, a lot of times we're crying out for God to do things, you know, oh God, bless me and prosper me and Help me succeed and, and help me, you know, do all this kind of stuff. And, but we're not actually putting ourselves under the surgeon's knife many times to allow him to get down in there and change some of those attitudes and some of those belief systems and those thought patterns and mindsets that are just deep-rooted down on the inside of us that need to be dealt with. Yes. And that means you're going to have to be corrected. Amen. That means I'm going to have to be corrected. Hallelujah. I tell you, when you, you go on the course, uh, you, you fly a plane any distance at all, you have to have constant course corrections because things will continue to kind of blow you off course a little bit. And we're all subject to the outside, to the natural realm, to the influence of, you know, the fallen realm that we live in right now and other people's opinions and everything else. And so we have, to, we have to come back many times and allow the Lord just to begin to reveal those things to us that need to be gotten rid of. And some things have been rooted in us all of our life. I mean, the enemy starts working on people the day they're, they're born, I can tell you. He starts working on them to develop mindsets and belief systems that are basically contrary to God. See, the whole world system is in rebellion to God because... The enemy it is formed by the enemy, the devil, and he is the rebel. He is the number one rebel without a cause, I can tell you. And he, he tries to influence people to be rebellious against the Lord. But I can tell you, re rebelling against the Lord is not going to help you at all. I'll say that again. Rebelling against the Lord is not going to help you at all. You say, well, I'm not rebelling against the Lord. But listen, if we are resistant to allowing him to change our thoughts and our attitudes and our belief systems, then to some degree we're, we're rebellious there. Maybe not like somebody just blowing in the wind, you know, out there, but I'm talking about it's still a rebellion there. It's just a resistance. Any resistance is a rebellion. Amen. And so the Lord wants to do this for your own good. Hallelujah. He wants to do this for your good. He wants to bring you to a position where he can use you, prosper you, bless you, and cause you to be successful in every endeavor of life. But that means we're going to have to change our mind on some things. We're going to have to change our beliefs on some things. Amen. We haven't arrived. But at some point, you've got to get on the train, head the right direction. Isn't that right? And that's what we're doing here. All right, let's look over in Ephesians chapter 4 again. You ready for this? Yes. It's a good one. Praise God. All right, Ephesians chapter 4. Now, uh, in Ephesians chapter 4, of course, like we said last week, it's a transitional chapter. He has given three chapters previously 
in Ephesians that are concentrated dosages of revelation of who we are and what we have in Christ. And so I'm talking about concentrated. You have to, you have to pray in the Holy Ghost to get, get what's in, in, in those three chapters out because there is just so much in that. So by the time he gets to chapter 4, is transitional. In other words, in first three chapters, he talks about who we are in Christ, what we have in him. We call it positional truth. But then over in chapter 4, he begins to transition over into bringing the positional truth over into practical reality. In other words, beginning to walk it out. See, everything that you are in your spirit, everything that God's deposited in you in your spirit, needs to come out and bear fruit. It needs to be in your daily walk. Now, when we talk about walking this thing out, that is your behavior. In other words, your behavior is reflected about what's on the inside of us. And you remember I gave you that illustration with the pipe, and I said God has put everything in your spirit, but it has to flow through your soul. What is your soul? Your mind, your will, and emotions. That's the part that has to be renovated and renewed to begin to think in a line with, with God. God has given us his higher thoughts in the New Testament. He wants us to begin to think like he thinks. Yes. He wants us to begin to believe like he believes. He wants us to begin to see things like he sees things. Yes. But in order to do that, you're going to have to renew your mind because that's, your soul was not instantly changed and born again. Right. Everybody know that. Right. Your mind wasn't just all of a sudden instantly changed just like your spirit was. Your spirit was instantly recreated when you made Jesus the Lord of your life. That was an instantaneous miracle. But your soul is a process of renewal and renovation. Now, why is that? Because your will is embedded in your soul. And God's not going to override your will. He's not. He'll give you as much as you want or as little as you want. The problem is a lot of people, most people, you don't have the attitude that, you know, if I can live without God, I will. But you got to get to the point where I cannot live without God. In any area of my life, I need him in every area of my life. I'm not going to just confine him and marginalize him over into one day of a week or just this part of my life. I want him in every area, every dimension of my life. I need him everywhere. And listen, I'm, I'm not that old, but I've lived a few years. But the, more I, the longer I live, the more I, I realize I need God everywhere, every part of my life. In fact, I want him in his fullness in every part of my life. Well, I already have it in my spirit. One third of you is already completely radically changed, born again, filled with God. But God wants to fill every part of your life with that. But it has to get through that valve. Remember that valve I talked about, your soul? And it can only filter through or flow through that, that valve to the degree to which that soul is renewed and thinks and believes and sees things like he does. Amen. And then what happens? Well, two-thirds majority wins. Two-thirds, if you get your soul and your spirit in a line together in harmony, then it'll overrule the, the body. Amen. That's not a problem. A lot of people are trying to deal with things outside, but they've not really deal, dealt with the soul issue. But see, God's not just about behavioral modification. It's all about heart transformation. Because once you get your heart transformed, then the behavioral uh, modification will come automatically. Isn't that right? But a lot of people, they're trying to deal with the outside, the flesh, through the power of their will, and that's just not going to work. But when you start getting your mind renewed and start thinking like God and seeing things from the way God sees them, then all of a sudden everything lines up. And your body will be put under in, in the back seat, like we like to say. And so really what he's talking about here in Ephesians chapter 4 is transitional. But I want to look at verse number 17 and 18. It says, This I say therefore in testifying the Lord, that you should no longer walk. And he's talking to believers here, spirit-filled believers. And he's telling them, you should no longer walk. In other words, behave, act, react outwardly as the rest of the Gentiles walk. Now, who are the Gentiles? Well, those are unbelievers. Those are people who are not born again, don't know God, living their life down here like there is no God, basically. 
And if he is, you know, if he does exist, you know, in their mind, then he's just an afterthought. And they're basically just separated away from him. And they are. They don't have to be. But notice right here, he said, we ought not to be walking or behaving, living like them. So he said, in the futility of their mind. Now, we pointed out last week, the word futility there means transientness. It's like somebody wandering around. Wandering around aimlessly with no actual home, no actual roots down anywhere. They're just floating around. Just whatever the world does, they do that. They just react to the winds and the waves that go on in the natural realm. And see, that's why that's where the Gentiles operate. You know, we saw that about three years ago with the COVID thing. All the Gentiles, they came unglued. Some of them lost their mind. Now, listen, the, the title of this whole series is Losing Your Mind, but the idea is to gain his. Not just lose your mind, but to lose the old mindset and to gain his mindset. But a lot of those people just lost their minds. Some, some of them are still like that. They're still in fear. They're still anxious. He's saying you ought not to be reacting and acting like that. That's not the way the church, the believer, should be acting. Amen. Amen. So he says there in verse number 18. He goes on to verse 18 and says, Having their understanding darkened. Having their understanding darkened. What happens when the lights go out? It gets dark. What, what happens when, when it's dark, you know, in your room or whatever? You can't see. You can't see what's in front of you. The things are there. They don't just disappear. They're there, but you just can't see them. So it's hard to navigate that. God doesn't want you in the dark. Amen. Listen, God doesn't want you in the dark about what's going on in the world today. The Bible calls us children of light. In other words, we ought not to be acting and reacting like the rest of the world, losing our peace, losing our mind, losing everything else in our life. Listen, we ought to be, we ought to be founded and looking at things from a different outlook and perspective, seeing things in the light. Then when we see all these things going on in the earth, we're not looking in darkness. We're looking in light. We're seeing, listen, it's time to look up for our redemption draws now. Listen, this is transitional. This is not the end of things. This is actually the beginning of things. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Isn't that a different perspective? But see, the rest of the world, what are they looking at? Well, the end of the age is coming. Yeah, but for us, yeah, that age is closing. But the beginning of the next age is glorious. See, it's that eternal perspective. See, you ought to have an eternal perspective. The Gentiles don't have that. They just believe that this is it. Life is life. Once it's over, it's done. But to the believer, even to those who passed on, you know, my mom passed on about six months ago. She didn't cease to exist. She just stepped over into a realm of eternity. Glory to God. See, that's, that's the perspective that the believer ought to have. Yes, I sorrowed about that, but the Bible says that we don't sorrow as those who have no hope. See, I have a hope in there because I'm seeing something. I see beyond just the grave. I see beyond just this natural life. I see beyond today's headlines. That's why we don't, we're not falling apart like a $2 suitcase, getting in fear about everything. You start following the ups and downs of Wall Street and the economy. Listen, you are going to be a basket case. That's why we have to look beyond that and see the kingdom of God. Look at the things which are not seen. All right, so it says, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of of their heart. Now, see, that's the Gentiles, but that should not be us. Right. Now, no, lo, notice there that when your understanding is darkened, your heart is blind, and you're walking in ignorance, you're being alienated from the life of God. What does that mean? You got the valve shut off. 
See, because we've already pointed out the life of God is in our spirits. We're walking around with the life and the power and the strength of God right now. But see, you can cut that valve off by being darkened in your understanding, by being ignorant. Now, the word ignorant there is mean, it comes from the word ignore. That means you're ignorant because you're ignoring God. You're ignoring the truth of God's word. You're ignoring it. That means you don't value it. You don't honor it. That's the way the world is. They don't honor and value the things of God. They think they're foolish. Oh, that's foolish. You try to talk to people about the things of God and the faith. Oh, that's just foolishness. Yeah. Foolish. Yep. What does that mean? Understanding darkened, ignorant, blind. Is that you? No. Why would I want to join their club? Because yeah. when you join their club, you're going to get the same thing they get. I don't want what they get. No, I don't want to be a basket case. No. Amen. I don't be walking around in fear every day. No. I want to be walking around with such hope Hallelujah. that when people come and say, what's that joy on your face when everybody else is glum and blue? Right. You, ha you can give them an answer for the hope that is within Amen. you. Right. Listen, I look beyond all of that stuff. I look to Jesus. Jesus. Who is Jesus? Well, let me tell you all about him. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. See, we're not talking about religion right now. I'm not talking about getting people religious. I'm talking about people coming to know the Lord Jesus in a major, major way. All right. Now, again, Ephesians 4, when he's saying these things in these two verses, he has already given us all kinds of revelation. So let's back up just a little bit. Um, uh, let's just go to Ephesians 2. We were in Ephesians 1 last week. You know the big Ephesians 1 prayer. What is that Ephesians 1 prayer about? Well, it says, I pray that, you would, that God would give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your heart or understanding being enlightened. So for the believer, your heart needs to be enlightened. So that's the next thing you do. Once you get born again, what happens? Well, you need to have an enlightened heart so that you're not darkened in your understanding and you're seeing things correctly according to truth. Yeah. Amen. Is that going to make a difference in your life? Well, Jesus said, when you know the truth, you'll be, you'll be free. You'll walk in freedom. Amen. So what happens when you're walking in darkness? No freedom. You're in bondage. You're under oppression. See, God wants to set you free from every bondage, all oppression, all of it. But in order to do that, he's got to get you to come to the knowledge of the truth or have your understanding enlightened. And so he goes through a number of things in chapter one, praying that. I prayed those for you this morning before you got here, that you would have a heart enlightened to see the way things really are. In other words, who you are and what you have in Christ. That when you're feeling under you know, the weight of the world, actually, you're on top of the world. You're so far above the principalities and powers that you can't hardly even see them. Isn't that right? Why? Because you're lifted up and seated with him in heavenly places. But here in chapter 2, he says in verse 1, he says, and you. So he's including you in this, right? He said all this stuff about Jesus, all this stuff about Christ in chapter 1. But then he says, and you. He made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. Notice we're not dead now. Right. Were means that's the way you were, but not now. It, in, it implies the fact that you're not dead anymore. Amen. He made you alive. So notice, he, who were dead in trespasses and sins, verse 2, in which you once walked. See, this is when you were dead in trespasses and sins. In which you once walked according to the course of this world. According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the sons of disobedience. See, that's, that's descriptive of a, a, a non-believer, a Gentile. People out there in the world have not received Jesus yet. That is descriptive of them and their walk. They once walked, what, according to the course of this world? See, the enemy set up a whole philosophy, a mindset. He set up a whole government, all substitutes for God. All substitutes for the kingdom of God. You know why? Because he wants to rule and reign over that. That's why the Bible calls him the God, little g, the little, little God of this world. 
He's not the God of us. We change lordships. But listen, he's the God of this world. He's the God of that world system that he created. And he will keep you under dominion under that, that course, under that, uh, that world system, as long as you think that way. As long as you believe that way and you act that way, he'll keep you under that even as a believer. In other words, he locks down the life of God, the power of God on the inside of you. He wants to suppress it. Because what happens, what happens when the light comes out and starts shining? Then you start seeing things, everybody starts seeing things the way they are. Acts chapter 8, when Philip went down to the city of Samaria, preached Christ to them. But you know what? He didn't just preach, he demonstrated. Signs, wonders, and miracles, people being healed, devils cast out. You know what? All of a sudden they began to heed and, and give heed to the things that he had spoken. What happened? The light shined. This is the way things really are. In the kingdom of God, now the enemies tried to convince everybody that, you know, you come over into this and it's a hard life. It's hard life. No, it's a hard life over there. It's not a hard life over here. Amen. Well, God will make you sick. No, that's not it at all. No, you get healed over here. You get sick in his kingdom. You get healed in, in God's kingdom. Isn't that right? Well, you know, then you, you, you'll get poor. God will take all your money away. He'll make you have a, a vow of poverty. That is unbiblical, folks. Nowhere in the Bible you're going to find that anywhere. Vow of poverty. That's, that's right out of the pit of hell. I can tell you right now. Because God wants to bless you so much, it shines light on the world's system and the world's depravity and shows that God can take care of everybody in grand style. He wants to use you as an advertising agency. But see, again, you've got to come out of that world's way of thinking and believing. You can't just... I'm not talking about religion. See, that's a substitute again. Another substitute. The spirit of Antichrist is all about substitution. When the Antichrist comes, he's, he's alive probably in the earth right now. When he rises up, it's all about a substitute. He's going to try to bring peace. He's going to try to bring provision for the, for the dying world. He's going to set himself up to be God. But he isn't. He's a substitute. But the true and real God can take care of everybody and their needs. God wants you to understand that. All right, so, so verse number three, let's go on to verse three. He said, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh. In other words, the flesh was in the driver's seat, driving you down the road of destruction, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature. See, that's the problem. We were by nature. Our nature had to be changed. We were by nature the children of wrath, just as others. Now, see, that's, that's all description of the way we used to be. Do you see that? Yes, sir. That's the way we were. The old, the old song about 50 years ago. You know, the way we were. I won't sing it. But anyway, the way we were. But that's not the way we are now. Amen. Oh, if we could just go back to the way things were in the good old days. When were those days anyway? I've got a short series coming up at the end of this year, subsequent to this one. And I'm going to title it, The Best is Yet to Come. Because really, we're, getting, we're going from glory to glory and faith to faith. We ought not to be going down and getting dark. Well, the world's getting darker. Yeah, but we shouldn't be. Isaiah 60 ought to be coming to pass in our life. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of God has risen upon you. And see, God wants to reflect that in the church, but the church is going to have to get their thinking in line with him. All right, so he's describing here in these two verses the way we were. And, of course, we just read we ought not to be walking this way anymore. We ought to have our understanding, our heart enlightened to see things differently because they are different. All right, so look at verse 4. This is where everything changed right here. It says, but God. See, we were going the wrong way, but God. He intercepted us. Hallelujah. He says, but God, notice, who is rich in mercy. What do you say? Rich in mercy. 
He didn't say he had a little bit. He says he's rich. In, you know when it says God is rich? Oh, brother, it's beyond comprehension. God is rich in mercy. Listen, because of his great love. Mm -mm -mm. The Amplified says because of and in order to satisfy his great, wonderful, and intense love that he has for us. See, it's trying to describe the, the kind of love that God has for us. See, this is where everything hinged right here. Everything hinged on this one verse. Yeah. We were like this, yeah. but what happened? What intercepted it? God did. Yes. But God who is rich in mercy. Now see, he could have said, well, God who is rich in power. Well, he has that. But listen, God can be rich in power, but unless he's merciful, he's not going to extend his power to help you at all. So you need to know his heart. If you know what's in his heart, you can receive what's in his hand. Amen. He said, because of his great, wonderful, and intense love, with which he has loved us. His love is what made the, the road in the wilderness and a river in the desert. His love made a way when there was no way. His love made a way of saving you when there was no way to save yourself. Now listen, because of his love, we would have to call what Jesus did in the work of salvation a radical change, wouldn't we? I mean, that would even be an understatement. I don't even have words to describe what kind of radical change it was to go from darkness to light, from being a child of Satan to a child of God, to be an outcast and an outsider, to be in the most, uh, the, the closest insider you could possibly get and an heir of God and a joint heir with Christ himself. But listen, if his, listen, if his love did that radical change in your spirit, it's already done. Work of love has already worked a radical change in your born-again, recreated spirit. Then it goes without saying, in order for us to have a radical mindset change and a belief system change in our heart, then we're going to also have to incorporate the same love of God in that. It's God's love that's going to change your mind. It'll tear down every wall. It'll, it will do away with everything, the enemy, every fence that the enemy is, a, is built up in your life. I can say this from personal testimony. I'm still on this journey, by the way. But 40 years ago, when I really got serious about the Lord, I got out of high school and I said, God, I want everything you got for me. I wasn't looking for ministry. I wasn't looking to even be called to the ministry. I wasn't even thinking ministry. I was just thanking God. I was wanting to have all of God I could possibly get. I just, I just put it all. I said, you know what? I've, my life so far, I don't know where I'm going, what I'm doing. You know, I'm just kind of wandering around like I was talking about transient. Didn't know where I, what purpose I had in life. I just went after God. And you know what? The first thing he did, he began to reveal his love to me. And that love opened the doors of my heart. So that I could receive his plan for my life. So that I, be, I could begin to see into the things that already belong to me as a born again believer. And I've been saved for 10 years. Didn't know any of it. You know why I didn't know it? Because I couldn't see it. You know why I couldn't see it? I had mind blinders on. That kept me from seeing that. That when I began to get a revelation of God's love. Man it just to pull back the curtains off of my heart and I begin to see everything that God had for me. I'm still looking into that. See, because it's beyond comprehension. There's no limit to it. There's no limit to this. God's love is so great, so intense, so big for us. Boy, I tell you, we're going to look at it for our entire life and we'll still be looking at things. You can get your spiritual Hubble telescope out and try to see the ends of the universe of God's love, and you'll never see it. 
you'll still be discovering things in God's love and grace. But every time you see something, it pulls those curtains back. It helps clear your vision up a little bit more so that you can see everything that God already has for us. See, I'm talking about an eye-opening experience with the Most High. You know, really, Paul got knocked off his high horse on the road to Damascus. And there were scales on his eyes. But really what changed him in his heart from that hardcore, legalistic, prideful, self-righteous attitude that he had, what tore all that down was when he got a face-to-face -face revelation of God's love in Christ. This is what he's writing about right here. He was writing about himself. Once walking according to the court, yes, religious, but still going according to the rest of the Gentile world like he was without God. Yeah. Trying to love God into loving him. That'll never happen. 1 John 4, 19 says we love him because he first loved us. See, all that stuff I was talking about earlier is in context of this right here. Because Paul did not pray for them to have more dedication. He prayed for them to have more revelation. Yes. Because once you get a revelation of the heart of God, you'll become more dedicated. You'll get sold out. Hallelujah. I just need to be more spiritual. I need to be more sold out. <laughs> then you start praying these prayers here in Ephesians. And you know what the love of God did? It describes two verses before this. We just read. According to the course of this world, prince of the power of the air, the spirit works, and the sons of disobedience... All those other things right there. But notice the two verses that follow verse 4. He says, even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And he raised us up together with Christ and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So if you take the two verses before verse 4, we were heading the wrong direction. Plan of destruction. We we're going down a road that was out. But God, there's your hinging port, verse 4, because of his great love or with he has loved us. Then in verse 5 and 6, he not only restores us to the place the first Adam had, he restores us to the place the last Adam had, the son of the living God, the agent of creation. Sees us how great, wonderful, and intense God's love is. He didn't just save us from. He saved us to. But what he saved us to is equal to what Jesus had himself. That's right. He pulled us into the same avenue of sonship, a position of righteousness that Jesus himself has. He gave us joint seating with Jesus at the right hand of God. Now see, you will never see that and you will never accept that until you see verse 4. Once you see verse 4, your eyes are opened and now you can see and accept God's love. It wasn't my love for God. His love was so great, wonderful, intense for me. He took me out of the lowest place and put me in the highest place I could possibly be at. See, this is why religion has a hard time accepting a lot of these verses. And I was. I was religious for 10 years. Born again, but religious. Couldn't see any of it. But I, because I couldn't see beyond the religion. Religion's all focused on how much we love God. And listen, we should love God. But listen, really, this relationship is all God-based. Yes. It's all God-originated. Yes. It all has to come down to this point. For God so loved the world, so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son. He didn't say he loved the world. He said he so loved the world. In other words, the degree to which he loved us calls Jesus to give us his best yes. when we deserved him the least. 
See, when your eyes of your heart begin to be enlightened to that love of God, the love of the Father for us, then what happens? That begins to open your eyes up to everything else you have. You'll begin to walk in it almost automatically. All right, chapter 3, real quick. You good? This is the second prayer of Ephesians that we pray, and I prayed this for for you this morning. Because really, I understand that unless you have the spirit of wisdom and revelation, the words that I say probably go in one ear and out the other. That's why a lot of folks, you know, you, you have a whole congregation of folks, they're all hearing at different degrees. They're all seeing things at different levels. It's because, first of all, and this is why I preach on this all the time, you have to understand and know God's love for you. You have to be so enlightened to the Father's love for you. You have to know that he would do anything for his kids. He would do anything. He already proved that. He gave you Jesus. That means he would do anything for you. Anything for you. God's not reluctant. He's not a withholder. Romans 8, 32. If God did not withhold his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? All right, now, Ephesians 3. Notice the beginning of this prayer in verse number 4. 14, excuse me. It says, for this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who are you bowing your knees to? Well, he's the God of the universe, but he's also your Father. So he's bowing our knees to the God, uh, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family. Who's in that family? I won't see the hands of everybody that's in the family of God. There we go. So you know what? You're praying to a God. You're communicating to a God who is your father, and you're in his family. You're not an outsider. You're an insider. You're not a beggar. You're a believer. You're not an orphan. You're a son and a daughter. All right, so he says uh, in verse 16 that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory. Is he rich in his glory? <laughs> yeah. In other words, out of the riches of God's glory, according to that, this is what he's doing. He's given you this, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. Now notice where the strength is. Where is it? The inner man. What's the inner man? That's your spirit, your born again spirit. So listen, the strength is already in your spirit. The power of God that raised Jesus from the dead is already in your spirit. But listen, this prayer has to do with releasing the power. There is something that that God wants to do in this prayer when he answers it that's going to release the power and the strength of God. Are we ready for this? Let's read on. Verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Let's stop right there. That Christ may do what? Dwell. That means take up residence. Where? In your heart. Listen, he's already in your spirit. But he wants to take up residence in your heart. That means that our thinking and our beliefs have to line up with him. That's what it uh, is talking about with him taking up residence in your heart, that his thoughts are your thoughts. His ways are your ways. In other words, his ways of seeing things are your ways of seeing things. Do you see this? Do you see this? All right. So he says that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you... Being rooted, he said you, that means you individually, personally. He could have said y'all, but that would be collective. But he said personally. So in other words, you've got to personalize the love of God for you, just the way John did. John referred to himself five times in his gospel as the disciple whom Jesus loved. Well, how arrogant can you be? No, he's personalizing the love of God towards him. Yes, God so loved the world, but that means you, he loves you. He so loved you that he gave you Jesus. All right, so he says that you being rooted 
and grounded in love. In other words, the love of God, the revelation of the love of God is foundational. Now, a lot of people think, well, I know that. as a nursery rhyme. Jesus loves me. This I know for the Bible tells me so. And they just kind of forget that with all the childhood stuff. Listen, you never outgrow this. Any, listen, you don't ever outgrow foundational, fundamental things. Foundational truths, fundamental truths are good for any level of growth, any degree of growth that you're going to go through. In other words, you never, you never leave that. You never leave this foundational truth right here. In other words, your roots are going down deeper and deeper in this truth. And how deep your roots go or how much fruit's going to be bearing in your life. If you're not seeing a manifestation, it's because of this right here. You're not rooted and grounded in this one reality. See, the, the church is looking for some kind of new revelation a lot of times. They're just itching for some kind of new gimmick or new twist on something. Listen, we need to go back to this. This is foundational. With everything that we deal with, like what I dealt with earlier, I always keep one hand on the love of God. Yes. I always use it in context of that. What happens when we don't do that? And, and you're going to fall under condemnation. You will receive that as condemnation, not correction. Why? Because you don't have that one hand, that rooted and grounded, that foundational truth that God loves me no matter what. And see, the way God loves you is unconditional. It's not based on you. If it were based on us, Jesus never would have come. So God showed his unconditional love towards us by sending us Jesus. And we are to be rooted and grounded in this. In other words, you're to be feeding on this one reality over and over again in your life. If your faith is wavering, it's because you probably have left your roots or you didn't have any. Or you, your roots are in religion. Or your roots are in opinions. Or your roots are in something else out there. Listen, it has to be in God's love for me personally. Because you're not going to bear much fruit without it. Most of the church, well, listen, even word of faith, stuff I've grown up in, we've done all kinds of stuff trying to get God to notice us. We're trying to get God's attention all the time. We're trying to get God to love us. God, please send a revival down here. Don't you know everybody's going to hell? He knows that. Do you think he loves those people less than you do? There's something wrong if you think that. But that's the way most of us think. Oh, if we could just, if we could just get enough people praying and bombarding the gates of heaven long enough, we'll fast long enough that we're so skinny we're barely breathing. And then God will maybe show up. That is not the way this is. That is not the way this is. We've had this all wrong. We're trying to get God to love us. That's the Peter syndrome. He was always trying to love Jesus into loving him until it finally dawned on him. After he had denied the Lord three times and the Lord restored him. It finally dawned on him, you know what? Jesus loves me unconditionally. Yes. My relationship with him is not based on me and what I can do for him. It's all based on what he did for me. I tell you, this, this message right here will change your life from the inside out. Because it's going to open your eyes to everything that God wants you to have and walk in. All right, so where we leave off, verse 17, that you being rooted and grounded in love, verse 18, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height. So God's love is not two-dimensional. It's four-dimensional. Bill Winston says 4D. All right. So we're talking about a four-dimensional love. With a width, length, depth, and a height. And you're going to have to have some help to comprehend it. You know why? Because the natural mind cannot comprehend it. 
natural man cannot understand and receive the things of God. It takes the Holy Ghost on the inside of you to help you comprehend this. And listen, you can know things in your spirit that you do not know in your head. If you're trying to understand this with your head, you'll never get there. But if you allow the Holy Spirit to begin to open your heart to reveal this comprehension of how much God loves you. But you got to get him something to work with, though. You got to be thinking about this. You got to be meditating along this line and not meditating on all the other junk in the world. You're feeding on the trash of the world noon and night. You're not, you're not going to get any revelation of God's love there. So you're going to have to place your, yourself under the agent of change. The Word of God and the Holy Ghost. All right, so notice. He said that you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, length, depth, and height, and to know the love of Christ, which what? Passes knowledge. Well, how, how are you going to know something that passes knowledge? It passes this intellectual knowledge that is only going to understand and receive things according to what you can see in the natural realm, natural sense knowledge. But listen, the love of God is so great, there's nothing in this natural realm to compare it to. Nothing. Unless you look at Jesus. When you look at Jesus, then you begin to see how much God loves you. How much does God love you? Well, John chapter 17, Jesus himself prayed that the Father would reveal to us, all of us, the fact that he loves us just as much as he loves Jesus. He said, well, how could that be? Well, because he gave Jesus for you. He loved you so much, he gave Jesus for you to save your life. That doesn't diminish, listen, that doesn't diminish the Father's love for Jesus. That elevates the Father's love for you. Yes. This will change your life more than anything else. You'll have a whole different perspective. When you hear all that chaos in the world, you'll know that nothing is greater than your Father and no one is able to pluck you out of His hand. That no matter what happens today, tomorrow, next year, my Father loves me, yes, he does. and He will take care of me. Yes. All right, so notice. To know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, listen, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now, in your spirit, you're already filled with the fullness of God. What he wants to do is fill every dimension and every area of your life with him. How is that going to happen? How is God going to fill your whole life to overflowing with himself? And think about this. What if God filled you with the fullness of God in your body? Sickness and disease wouldn't be able to stay there. What if he filled you with all the fullness of God in your marriage, in your relationships? That'd take away a lot of the problems. Listen, when you get a revelation of the Father's love for you, it does away with the selfishness and the pride. It does away with envy. It does away with jealousy. It does away with all that stuff that we're talking about that causes trouble in relationships. Because if I know my Father loves me, He loves me personally as much as anybody else, I don't have to be envious of anybody else. I don't have to be jealous of what somebody else is getting. Why? Because my father is taking care of me. He loves me just as much. I have just as much favor and blessing as, as anybody else. Right. Amen. And listen, of all the formulas that I, we have tried in the church over the last 40 years, fasting, praying, squalling, bawling, doing all the right things to try to get God to move in our midst, we forgot this one simple, simple thing right here, yeah. that when we begin to see the width, de depth, height, breadth, whatever, of the love of God, then all of a sudden that opens that valve up. I don't have to get God to pour out His Spirit. It's already in me. I need for it to be poured out of my spirit. But in order to do that, I've got to open that, that valve and get it in alignment. Well, in other words, the more I see of God's love for me, the more of that life of God begins to pour out of me. The more the power of God begins to flow out of me. 
the more of Jesus the world is going to see and the less of you, which is good. We don't want the old man. We want the new man. We want Christ being reflected and bearing fruit in our life. You think that's the end of that? That's pretty good, isn't it? Verse number 20. Look here. Oh, I like verse 20. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that's already at work within us. Now, so we, we, we all, we all, we don't struggle with the fact necessarily as believers that God has the power. We just, we just struggle and doubt and waver in our hearts whether God is willing to use his power on our behalf. But listen, this ought to answer that question because the power is already in there. We're not trying to get God to put power in there. He's already put the power in. That means that he already wanted us to have it. It's already his will for us to have it. It's already for his will for us to be filled with the very fullness of God. In fact, to the point, the power is so great on the inside of you, it'll do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think. So the question is not whether the power is there. In fact, there is no question. Now there's a statement of reality that God loves me so much, he's already put the power in there. Therefore, all I need to do is release it in my life. And wherever there's, we're filled with the fullness of God in an area, the need goes away. Amen. The deficiency goes away. Yep. The problem goes away. We get self out. Oh, man. And then God comes flooding in with all his power. You can see how this is related, can't you? A lot of times we quote this verse out of context, but when we start seeing the magnitude of God's love for us, then it opens us up to allow God to be able to do what he wants to do, which is something God-sized. Is this what the world needs right now? Oh, you better believe it. I'm going to stop because I'm, lo- I'm about out of juice in this thing. Praise God. Everybody stand up. Thank you, Lord.